Hello everyone, welcome to this video discussion. So in this video, I should be talking about multimodality. Now we know that in this course analysis, multimodality is one of the widely used methods, meaning when we would like to analyze different kinds of visuals, texts, then multimodality is one of the most fitted uh, methods that we can use for us to really make sure that we unravel the substantial meanings of the multimodal texts that we are analyzing. So before we fully analyze what multimodal texts are, allow me to introduce you first to the basic concepts and some facts about the history of when multimodality started. So the term multimodality designates a phenomenon rather than a theory or a method, a phenomenon that this course is almost always multimodal. So wherever we look at, there are really instances when these courses are multimodal, meaning there are a lot of semiotic systems used when delivering these courses. So for example, you have there the image, the other elements of visuals, and then you also have the text, plus you also have the audio or the sounds used. Now, all of this, once used in one discourse, the discourse in itself is already considered multimodal. So the term multimodal indicates that different semiotic modes, for instance, language and image, are combined and integrated in a given instance of discourse or kind of discourse. Spoken discourse, for example, integrates language with intonation, voice quality, facial expression, gesture, and posture, as well as aspects of self-presentation such as dress and hairstyle. So for example, when a person speaks in front, and you analyze that person in terms of how he or she delivers his or her discourses, you also need to consider the rest of the elements present, which include the dress, the hairstyle, the conduct in front of the people. Written discourse integrates language with typographic expression and increasingly also the illustration layout in color. Now, when we analyze multimodal discourse, it is very important that we look at the total the totality of the discourse so that we can also consider the rest of the elements present. So it's not appropriate that you focus only on the text. You also have to consider other elements, may them be visual or oral in nature. So all of these are elements that need to be considered also in the analysis of multimodal discourse. Now, multimodality focuses on the common properties of and differences between these different semiotic modes and on the ways in which they are integrated in multimodal texts and communicative events. So when you analyze multimodal discourse, you also have to consider the communicative event, when the discourses are used or when the specific communicative event happened. So the contemporary interest in multimodality was stimulated by the increasing multimodality of contemporary communication. So because there are a lot, um, a lot of modes already used in terms of delivering these courses, then there is now this emergence of multimodality. So for example, we have magazines, display ads, comic strips, film, microphone, television, computer, social media, and technology. Now these are just few of the different modes of communication that we use for us to deliver the discourses. And this richness of multimodal discourses that we have actually sparks that interest among linguistic research as to the conduct of multimodal discourse analysis. So now it has been a trend in linguistic research because when you unravel the meaning of multimodal discourse, there is more to what you actually see in the multimodal discourse in itself. You can also unravel meanings or semantics by considering all of the elements present in the multimodal text. The interaction of the senses in perception was a topic in the psychology of perception as far back as the 1920s. More recently, historians such as Klassen in 1993 and Corbin in 1994 have begun to document the history of the senses and human-computer interaction. Specialists have also become increasingly interested in multimodality. So even before, we could already say that multimodality had been an interest in terms of linguistic research. During the 1930s and 1940s, the Prague School began to extend linguistics into the visual arts and the nonverbal aspects of theater. So before, the traditional linguistics would focus only on written or textual discourses, but with the advancement of various genres used in delivering discourses, 
there was also progression in terms of the scope of linguistics. So linguistics was extended really to the study of visual arts and other nonverbal aspects found in discourses. A study of traditional Moravian Slovakian dress, for example, described dress as a language conveying what is now called as the demographic information, age group, place of residence, marital status, religion, and occupation. So before, the way a person dressed could also be an interesting topic for multimodal discourse analysis. 1960s Paris school structuralist semiotics also used concepts and methods from linguistics to understand communicative modes other than language, applying these for the most part to analysis of popular culture in the mass media rather than to the arts. One good example for this is perhaps when you analyze the K-pop culture. You analyze not only the culture itself, but also the elements found in that culture. So you have to consider how people dress, okay, the fanaticism, the music, everything. And that can be part of multimodal discourse analysis primarily when you focus more not only on the discourses, but also on the portrayal of the culture based on the different nonverbal aspects found in the discourses of these people. American linguists took interest in the multimodal analysis of spoken language and nonverbal communication. So even the Western country, um, for example, the USA, was primarily interested on the conduct of multimodal analysis because of the emergence of different genres. Mediator discourse analysis pays close attention to the nonverbal aspects of social interactions. So for example, if you're engaged in a communicative event, mediator discourse analysis believes that the discourse should not be analyzed only. It's not, it's not the, the discourse which should be analyzed only, but you also need to consider other aspects of the communicative event. For example, the gestures, the facial expression, this form part um, of multimodality, the multimodal discourse that needs to be analyzed in terms of this communicative event. The Sydney School of Semiotics was inspired by the linguists, uh, linguistics of M.A.K. Halliday, and it was here that the term multimodality was first used. Now, to show you more about multimodality, mediator discourse analysis, or MDA, includes grammars of specific modes such as visual design, so the visual of the text itself may also be considered. For example, when you see a signage and then the signage is written in red text. So why is or why are the texts written in red? So there could be a hidden meaning for that. So that's part of the visual design. The body action, for example, the gestures, the walk, the stand. Okay? And of course, the music. For example, if you are to analyze TV plays, how could the music add more meaning to the TV plays being projected on the TV screen? Um, these also involve approaches to analyzing how different modes are integrated in multimodal texts, media discourse, and other domains of contemporary discourse and communication. For example, we have advertisements or commercials. Now, in terms of visual grammar, Sydney School grammars of non-linguistic semiotic modes assume that meanings belong to culture rather than to specific modes. So when you have meanings there, visual grammar perspective tells us that meanings are actually from culture and not really on the specific modes that we use when we channel the discourse. And further, it also suggests that any given communicative function or meaning can in principle be realized in any semiotic mode, albeit by different signifiers. So there could also be other um, signifiers that need to be considered in terms of discourse analysis. Now, there is semiotic commonality in the domain of meaning and semiotic difference in the domain in forms. For example, if you, look at this in, uh, if you look at these images here, we can see first objects. But out of these objects, we have pictogram here, which were actually um, referenced from these objects. So the way these pictograms are drawn um, were primarily based on the objects that are present or signified in the community or in the society. And then we also have rotated pictogram, and then we also have cuneiform. So we can see that there are commonalities, right, um, with the images that were used and then the signifiers also used in creating these symbols or letters. One important concept that must be talked about when it comes to multimodality is how genre is included or incorporated in the study of multimodal discourse analysis. The concept of genre has played a prominent role in multimodal discourse analysis as one of the principles that can integrate different modes into a multimodal whole. So for example, if you have there one whole, uh, an entire multimodal text, 
then we could say that it is a mixture. It is an amalgamation of different genres. So we have the music, yeah, the sound, of course, the visuals, the formatting, the technicalities of the multimodal discourse, and then you also have the text. As pioneered in Labov's 1972 narrative analysis, the genre is modeled as a sequence of stages with specific communicative functions. So when you say genre, each genre present in the multimodal text or in the totality of the multimodal text has a specific communicative function, meaning it, it contributes or it adds um, value to the meaning or the semantics of the multimodal discourse. And also in the particular order, they realize the overall communicative function of the genre. Now let's consider this one. So we have here a sample poster, and then this poster is titled The Guy. Does he want to be your new dude? Okay. Uh, we are not really sure if this one particularly is an advertisement, a commercial, or whatsoever, but what we know is that this is an e-poster. And that this is composed of different genres present in it. For example, we have here the text. The guy, does he want to be your new dude? And then you also have more texts here. And then you also have the image here. But we can see that there are only, I believe, four, uh, three colors present in this multimodal discourse itself. And then if you were to interpret, there are also different sizes of boxes here, different shapes used. Now, all of these differences contribute to the meaning being suggested by the whole of this multimodal discourse. So if you look here, we have somewhat like a title here, the guy, and then there's another um, mark here, and then we have here um, in gigantic text, we have does he want to be your new dude, and then we have here in bullets specific points which are also highlighted in white. Now, all of these are things we need to consider. And in terms of genre, we can say that there are different parts present in this multimodal discourse. So first one is we have here the dilemma. Okay, the dilemma because this one poses a question. What is this all about? And then here we can see the hinge. Okay, the hinge here connects the dilemma to the rest of the clues present in the multimodal discourse. And then the rest we have here clues one, two, three, and four. So the major subheadings present in this multimodal discourse are considered as the clues, okay? And they are being connected by the hinge to the dilemma. So in short, these clues provide answers or significance to the presented dilemma. So you could also analyze a multimodal discourse like that, okay, through that way. Now, when we talk of multimodality in genres, what I mentioned, we have dilemma, hinge, clues, and these are essential or integral elements of a multimodal discourse, meaning, you also need to consider the text in relation to the different elements, okay? Other elements, for example, the color, the design, and then the image portrayed here. So all of these elements need to be considered when analyzing multimodal discourse. This is another example. This one was taken from um, Shevsky's uh, printer, uh, Printer's Measure. This was a TV play way back in 1953. Now, if you notice, this is a scenario in the TV play, and then there is a specific pattern or format or structure used by the one who wrote, who, who wrote the TV play. For example, here we can see that there was call to attention, and then demonstration was used in this portion because this one, call to attention, Mr. Keely called the person, the, another, uh, the other character here. Hey, come here. So this is the call to attention pattern. And then we have your demonstration. Mr. Healy pulls out a letterhead, points to a line of print. It shows demonstration and then quizzing because this one asks um, for a, a question. What kind of type is that? And then we have your probing. How do you know? So this is in support to the first question given. And then we have instruction here. Clear face is a delicate type. It's clear. It's uh, got line in place. Remember that. And then we have your dismissal, which is the conclusion. Okay, The concluding part of this genre. Now, why is it really important for us to analyze text like this? Now, if we check our social media, there are actually instances when multimodal discourses are widely used by the netizens. One good example for these are memes, right? So when we check our social media sites, we can see a lot of memes proliferated by different netizens for different purposes. It's very important that before we share these memes, we understand all the elements present in them. Why? Because sometimes we just share them without knowing what's really the meaning behind those visuals, those images present in the memes. Or perhaps could there be a double speak, okay, or a double meaning or a hidden meaning behind the 
discourses or the texts used in the memes. So it's very vital that we create a deeper understanding of these multimodal discourses because it also affects the, the, the pieces of information that we channel in different platforms. And it also makes us more critical in terms of understanding text that before we share them, okay, or before we proliferate them, we understand them first because that's very important. Okay. Now, to further understand what multimodal discourse analysis is, let us analyze two images here. Let's take a look at this one. This is a famous um, commercial by Burger King. Now, if you look at the image, if we do multimodal discourse analysis, you need to consider all the elements present in the multimodal discourse. So we have here the image, okay, um, half image of a face of a woman, and then with lips here, and then with band-aids on each side. And then you also have here the logo of Burger King with the following text, bigger, better, Burger King. So in this case, we could already understand that the totality of the multimodal discourse will suggest one great meaning. And at first look, we could simply say that um, if it's on the literal level, we could understand this one as a woman maybe um, who might have wounded her mouth okay, or her lips. But if you're to consider the logo of Burger King here plus the motto of Burger King here, bigger, better Burger King, which means that maybe the mouth of the person, of this person might have been stretched okay, or might have been wounded because of how big the burger of Burger King is. Okay, So that is how we interpret multimodal discourse. We don't go what's literal. We go what's figurative, okay, what's hidden behind text. And then you also need to scrutinize the rest of the elements. For example, the colors, the angling, the positioning of the images, because they also contribute to the meaning of the text. Okay? One last image that I'd like to show you as an example is this one. This is actually an advertisement which provides us a very important message, and that is the effect of smoking. So if you could see here, and, and considering all of the elements here, there's no message really that is written textually. However, we can see it visually that there is an implied meaning. And that is smoking causes aging. Okay, most especially for women in this example. Now, if you look at this one, then it suggests strong meaning already to the consumers of this multimodal discourse. If you look at this, this could only be a contrasting um, image of a woman who is young and a woman, woman who is old. But if you are to consider this one here, the cigarette plus the smoke, then we could understand that it is actually the smoke of the cigarette which contributes to the aging of the woman in the image. So in multimodal discourse, again, it is vital that we understand the totality of the multimodal discourse. So the challenge here now is, when we encounter multimodal discourse, how do we critically analyze them? So the tip is, consider all elements. Do not, make sure that you do not leave one element not being considered in the analysis because it might have a big value okay, in, terms of how, or in terms of how the multimodal discourse should be understood or should be interpreted. So that is multimodal discourse analysis. So when you are, or if you are interested in the conduct of multimodal discourse analysis as a topic for linguistic research, you might want to analyze, for example, memes, okay, posters, the use of emojis, okay, we also have billboards, the designs of advertisements. These could be great subjects for multimodal discourse analysis. Now, if you have questions about this topic, you are, or you can post them in the open forum. Thank you very much for listening.